I'm going to talk about some of the things related to both genetic, genetics and management methods to imp improve reproductive efficiency in sows. And just as a little bit of a lead into some of this, as we all kind of are experiencing that pork profits are constrained today, obviously because of increased feed costs, all of us are getting increased labor costs as well. And we're also getting hit with increased labor issues. So all that means we've got to milk out the efficiency out of our uh, operations as best we can. And we do this to remain competitive with other food protein sources uh, in uh, the world. And then as we look at uh, North America's competitiveness, we want to remain competitive with other producers worldwide. So it's one of the reasons that we try to continually focus on improving our efficiency uh, wherever those efficiencies can be obtained. Related to feed costs, uh, it's impacted pork production many ways, and some of them are more obvious than others through grow finish cost of production, but they've had a tremendous impact on gilt development costs. And, whoops, I hit the... That's what you call having a fat finger and hitting the two buttons at once. We also see that gilt development costs have increased dramatically, and so much so, many of you know I've uh, developed a spreadsheet to see how long sows had to remain in the herd bef uh, before they pay for themselves or break even. If feed costs had remained low and the price is relatively where they, uh, they're at, we could have these sows paying for themselves or reaching that positive net present value within the first or uh, certainly within the second parity. But because feed costs have went up, uh, it's now uh, continuing to stay at parity three, or with what we see coming down the pike, really high feed costs, that positive net present value won't be attained until uh, feed costs decline or market prices increase. In other words, we're at such high feed costs right now, uh, if we're losing money, no matter how long they stayed in the herd, she's not going to pay for herself. So that's a short-term blip, hopefully. Hopefully market prices will come up and feed costs will come down such that the sow farms can be profitable soon. So what this has done is really uh, our larger uh, commercial producers and genetic suppliers really are beginning to recognize the value of sow longevity, the value of retaining that sow in the breeding herd for a greater number of parities so that you can spread those costs associated with gilt development over more pigs or that greater lifetime that, that Chris has talked about in the previous uh, presentation. But there are many contributing factors that lead a sow to leaving the breeding herd earlier uh, than what the farm management might desire. Chris talked about a little of those, and I put genetics at the top because I'm a geneticist and I'm giving the presentation, so I put it there. But the truth of the matter is there's a whole host of environmental factors, and I did put caretaker skills or stockmanship, and I think we as an industry need to recognize the impact that people have uh, in the barns today with, first of all, recognizing different uh, issues related to the sows. And For example, if you catch a sow when uh, she's first experiencing a lameness problem, you're more likely to be able to do something about that uh, to fix it and keep her in the herd. So the, the, the fact of the matter is that these caretaker skills or stockmanship skills that we see people have or not have in the barn can make a big difference in the efficiency from farm to farm. And then we saw all of these that Chris talked about. I'm not going to belabor those. It just gives you the magnitude of the problem when we're looking at uh, sow longevity. As Chris stated, many of these topics are not well researched, especially when we take into consideration modern housing systems and modern genetics. Uh, a lot of the studies were done uh, when universities had sow farms, and today many universities don't even have a sow farm with which to conduct these. So we're cooperating uh, with many of uh, commercial producers like yourselves uh, in this room. One of the things you try to start to identify where can we identify the low-hanging fruit or those areas where we might be able to make uh, 
the, the most amount of improvement or get more bang for our buck. And this is some older, older data, but I've looked at newer data and decided not to develop a new slide for the simple fact that the story's the same. We look at the early parodies and understand why sows are called. These sandy bars represent uh, uh, failure to breed or uh, reproductive issues. These checked bars represent lameness. And you can see in early parodies, up to about parity three, lameness is a big issue. And then it tends to fall off. And then the striped bars, excuse me, are old age. So if you really try to get more of these sows to go from here over to here, one of the things I think we need to focus on is the lameness issue. And I'd argue that our lameness estimates are likely underestimated. Uh, and a lot of those girls that get called for reproductive failure here exhibited a lameness problem, but actually were called because they didn't cycle or uh, they failed to conceive or what have you. But the, the cause of that issue occurred some, some time before as a lameness problem. So one of the things we decided to do was to examine a large number of cull sows. And of, out of the 3,100 that we looked at at harvest, about half of those we could trace back to a farm and had production records uh, to look at uh, uh, what they might have in common relative to their uh, farm productivity. We worked at two harvest plants. Uh, again, the farm production data, I guess, was closer to a third. And the objective was to characterize physical and reproductive conditions from call sows uh, at these two Midwestern plants. The traits we looked at were a variety of foot lesions. You can go through these, but everything you might think could be wrong with a foot lesion, either it was present or absent, but things like foot pad lesions, rear pad, front or rear cracked toes, digital overgrowth, missing dew claws, abscesses, and so forth. In this particular data set, what we saw that these pad lesions, and this is just an example of one, that about 67% of those sows that we looked at had at least one lesion on the rear foot. And uh, it could have been more severe than this or, or less, but again, two-thirds of those while only about a third of the sows had a front foot lesion. So you can see that these foot lesions, when they occur, are, are largely on the rear feet, but probably the back feet should not be ignored either. Crack toes uh, occurred more frequently on the front feet, although that's probably not statistically different. The, the fact is that about 20% of our sows exhibited cracked toes of some sort or another. And when we compared this back to the farm data, sows with front cracked toes compared to sows without cracked toes tended to have, at a P.07, fewer pigs born al alive per day of herd life, and what equated to about eight-tenths of a pig per sow per year. So if front cracked toes were present, those sows tended to be less productive. Digital overgrowth, about 20% of the sows exhibited some form of, of, of uh, toe overgrowth, and this primarily occurs on the rear feet. And if you look at the digital overgrowth by parity, and we group the, the parities, one and two, three and four, and so forth, you can see the overgrowth tend to increase as, uh, across time. And you saw the same kind of thing only to a much uh, smaller degree with front uh, toe overgrowth. The interesting thing about this is when we compare sows with rear o overgrowth with sows that didn't have uh, overgrown toes, you saw that they had fewer pigs born alive in the last litter, about a half a pig less, and a tendency for decreased pigs born uh, per day of herd life, again, that equated to about just under a, a uh, one pig. So that digital overgrowth, again, showing you that another foot problem having a significant uh, impact on sow productivity. The other thing we looked at, uh, traits we uh, were measuring, we did a visual examination of uh, the reproductive tract on each one of these sows, 
and evaluated the ovaries. And in this case, 80, about 85 percent of the sows were classified with normal appearing ovaries. Uh, Nine percent were acyclic, 6.3 were cystic, and in this particular data set, just under 6 percent were pregnant. Um, I think one of the things that sticks out to me is that we call about 35 percent of our sows for reproductive failure of some sort, but yet we see in this particular data set, 85 percent of the sows had normal appearing ovaries, and only 9 percent were acyclic. So is that an indictment on our heat detection methods, or are we not training our people well enough in the barn to catch those uh, sows that have more uh, oh, discreet or more, or more uh, difficulty finding them in estrus? I'm not sure. Maybe this tells us where there's an opportunity for some additional education or training uh, to help that stock person in the barn. You look at ovary status, and we evaluated body condition score uh, using a one to five system. And you can see here I'm only reporting four because we had so few sows in the five category that we lumped them in with the fours. But you can see uh, the normal sows appeared pretty similar across the body condition scores, where you start to see some uh, some sign uh, of association is with the acyclic sows tend to be those really thin sows in body condition score one. And those a slight trend to have those cystic ovaries be associated with uh, become more prevalent as the sows become fatter. The other thing we looked at were uh, look, looked at shoulder lesions. And in our particular data set, uh, over 80% of them had none. About 12 and a half had just an abrasion, uh, not, 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 nothing like what you see, see there with open wounds. Um, but we did see 5% of the sows with the open wound on the shoulders like you see here. If you look at that by body condition scores, you might expect uh, the lesions were much more prevalent in those really thin sows. And so if we can keep sows with proper body condition, uh, you see a lot less incidence of these shoulder lesions. The other interesting part of this is we, when we compare back to the farm records, sows with shoulder lesions had two fewer pigs per lifetime uh, born alive compared to sows without the shoulder lesion. But I think the real trick here is what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Did they become thin, and that's contributing to uh, the fewer pigs per lifetime, or did they get the shoulder lesion, or is it some combination of both? And with this particular data set, we, you couldn't uh, pick those things apart. The other things we looked at, things like uh, uh, systematic lesions, pneumonia. We uh, saw evidence of le pneumonia lesions in just under 10%, and of those, uh, of that total, 5% of those had 1% to 10% uh, lung involvement, and uh, the uh, last category is greater than 10%, and those were distributed about equally. Saw about 5% pleural adhesions, 1.7% of peritonitis in the sows. And if you start to look at this by body condition score as well, you can see, again, the association with all of those maladies, whether you're looking at pneumonia, pleural adhesion, or peritonitis, tended to be higher in those sows that had, were in poor body condition. But again, this begs the question, were they thin before they got sick, or did they get sick and became thin? And uh, there was no way for us to tell. These were just as they were presented uh, to us there at the packing plant. What we did see, though, is a higher percentage of lung involvement from pneumonia tended to be associated with higher producing sows. So when we compared the productivity of the records of those sows where we did have records, the higher producing sows tended to have uh, higher lung involvement uh, with pneumonia lesions. And that was whether we were looking at lifetime 
pigs born alive or this calculated value, the pigs born uh, per day of herd life. We looked at the teeth, uh, counted the teeth, uh, looked at top teeth number, bottom teeth number, and then we estimated a wear into three categories, minimum to none, moderate, and then severe. If you look at teeth wear by parity, um, you can see the severe, really low incidence, and as you might guess, as they get older, uh, it becomes much more uh, or much higher incidence. The moderate was kind of all over the board, but occurred primarily there in those middle parodies. And then the minimum, obviously, would be the opposite of the severe. The interesting part here was that sows with se severe te teeth wear relative to those sows that had no teeth wear had fewer pigs born alive in the last litter, just short of a half a pig. Fewer pigs born alive per day in a herd life that equated to over a, a pig per sow per year. So looking at this teeth wear uh, was quite interesting. And I will tell you, a lot of the wear uh, that we saw would be what we would call, or I'd call, bar biters. The sows grab a hold of the bars on the crate. They get that back in their mouth, and they'll twist. And you could just see the teeth were dished out from them chewing on the uh, chewing on the bars of the gestation crates. If you look at the culling reasons within these, uh, this data set of, of those sows that were from the farms where we had records, you can see that body condition, uh, culling occurred primarily in those early parodies. Old age didn't occur, good, which is a good thing, till the sows did real get really old. Lameness culling tended to occur all the way up through the sixth parity, other. And then poor performance really uh, didn't get to, to call for many of those until we got out of here into our older parodies, around fifth and sixth, when many herds have an automatic call. We look at reproduction. You can, as you might expect, those in the early parodies uh, where we expect the reproduction culling to occur is where it actually happened. No heat was the most uh, frequent farm culling code, uh, 41%. Did not conceive was the most common in parodies two through five. And of the sows called for reproductive failure, 86% were classified as having normal ovaries. So this goes back to my argument that those that were having or said they had reproductive failure appeared to have normal ovaries. So um, could this go back to some of the things we've talked about today? Was it a boar issue? Was it a stockmanship issue? Some of these things I think uh, we really need to get a better handle on than what we have today. So if we kind of look at the summary of that study, the cull sows evaluated at harvest had foot, Reproductive shoulder and uh, systematic lesions. Body condition was associated with uh, multiple abnormal conditions. Uh, several conditions were associated with reduced uh, sow performance. And the majority of low parity sows were called for reproductive failure, but the ovaries were normal in appearance. Another study we uh, did was designed to estimate the phenotypic and genetic association of guilt compositional and structural soundness traits with longevity traits. This, again, is a pork board-funded project, as was the previous study. And again, like the others, I'd like to thank the pork board for their support. Uh, otherwise, these studies wouldn't be possible. And what we were trying to do is determine factors measured or evaluated early in that sow's life that's associated with su uh, superior sow productive uh, lifetime. We collected the data through at least the fifth parity. The study involved just short of 1,500 females from two commercial lines. And uh, you can kind of get uh, an idea of what, what you can see here. Uh, the gilts were on average 198 days of age and 124 kilos at time when we evaluated body composition and structural soundness traits. Traits we looked at body composition-wise was, was body weight, loin muscle area, 
tenth rib fat and last rib back fat. And then we looked at a whole host of body structure and feet and leg soundness traits. And I won't go through all of those. If you're interested in them, I think they're in your uh, proceedings there, or we can visit later with each one of those. Reproductive traits we looked at was lifetime, total number born alive, uh, total born, excuse me, born, total number born alive, number born alive per day of lifetime. Uh, so we actually had birth dates here. You could actually calculate this on a per, her day of life if you'd like. And then we calculated a percentage of productive days from total herd days. Um, lifetime and herd days and removal parity were considered uh, our longevity traits. Just to give you an idea, there were two lines there. Um, both lines performed similarly and a little bit higher than what Chris has reported for uh, lifetime values. And if you look at lifetime born alive, uh, you can see there that we got 37 and 41. And 41 would be uh, what we would consider most uh, uh, parent lines. This particular herd was running some internal multiplication, so we did have some sows that were from the, the GP line as well. Kind of to summarize the, the entire uh, study here in just a few short bullet points, 70% of the females were removed prior to the sixth parity at the ter termination of this data collection. And interestingly, 14% of the females were still alive and in production uh, when we shut down the data collection. So 14% of them were alive beyond the sixth parity. And again, as you, we've talked about before, reproductive failure was the most frequent culling reasons uh, during the first three parities. And uh, it caused the loss of 16% uh, of the females before the fourth parity. Culling for lameness and feet and leg problems primarily occurred before the third parity and caused the removal of a total of 7.5% of those. From this, we were able to look at, uh, calculate some heritability estimates and the longevity traits. While it's kind of low, it's certainly better uh, than uh, some other measures that we, uh, for example, number born alive we select on, typically has a, a uh, heritability of something below 0.1. So these traits, we're finding that a decent heritability uh, that we could make improvement through genetic selection. Uh, this would include lifetime reproductive traits, heritability 0.13 to 0.17, as you might expect, those compositional traits, the back fat and the loin muscle area, were highly heritable. The body structure and the leg structural traits kind of fell in between those two, uh, those two particular traits. If you look at the heritability estimates obtained for weak front pasterns and uh, rear pastern posture were the highest. And if you've heard some of my talks in the past, uh, some of these traits, for example, having the really soft front pastures is an indicator of a sow that will stay in the, tra in the herd for a long period of time. So if you're wanting to select for that, it's one of the traits that has the higher heritability. The one thing that was disappointing was this overall leg action, and this goes back to a point every good design project is going to run into hiccups. This study was conducted in a brand new facility, thinking it was the ideal spot to do this work. We started evaluating our sows and trying to put scores on them for locomotion. We started noticing blood on the floor. Well, you can imagine what was happening. Brand new facility, the gilts were moseying around on these slats. The slats were sharp. They were cutting their foot pads. And of course, as soon as they cut their foot pads, my locomotion scores go out the window. So big study like this, um, just because the slats weren't properly uh, ground down uh, on the corners, we saw a significant number of those that got scored such that really my locomotion scores uh, weren't very good. And we saw that in the leg action heritability estimates. I'll let you read through some of those so I can uh, not use up all my time here. 
One of the things that we also looked at in another study was trying to help producers decide whether making culling decisions based upon trying to maintain, uh, well, a lot of producers are told by their genetic suppliers, don't worry about your replacement rate because you need to keep up with our genetic uh, progress that's occurring at the nucleus level. So to try to see if whether that was fact or fiction, we did, decided to do a study that looked at replacement uh, and culling decisions. Um, and basically what we came up with, that re replacement and culling decisions uh, should not be influenced by the genetic progress occurring in the maternal lines from their genetic supplier. And basically what we found was under most optimistic uh, genetic improvement situations, in other words, trying to look out the very best genetic progress that I could make, based on genetic progress alone, a sow wouldn't be replaced until the sixth or seventh parity. And this represents the parity where the value of the genetic progress made in that herd is equal or greater than the gilt development variable costs. Everybody follow what I mean? We've got variable costs sitting out here for developing that replacement gilt, and I wanted to figure out when the value of my genetic improvement was equal to that as a, as a parity to decide um, when those two things were equal so that I could worry about genetic progress and my culling decisions. So what that really tells us that I doubt most, are make, most genetic suppliers are making the most optimistic genetic improvement situation. In other words, I had a generation interval down at one and a half and maximum genetic progress on every trait. If you put those at more reasonable values, this value where those are equal drops to or increases to somewhere around the 10th or 11th parity. So if you're working with your producers and you're trying to think about the genetic progress that I make in my maternal lines, that shouldn't even weigh in at all in your decision uh, uh, for any type of calling. And the reason we chose that parity at which guilt development costs and genetic progress are equal, it defines the number of parities at the commercial breeding herds should be called for sows, or sows should be called for old age. So under realistic conditions, again, I said it ought to be around the 10th parity, and so these genetic issues should not enter into the uh, culling or replacement decisions in the breeding herd. So summary, many factors contribute to the ability to have a long and productive herd life. We've shown various management and uh, genetic traits that are related to longevity. And of course, these factors include the genetic and environmental issues, as we've talked about. And I didn't bring, on, bring this up until now, um, because I think a renewed focus on sow nutrition is warranted. Why do we see all these cracked hooves? Why do we feed sows all alike when we know that we have a guilt and we have old sows in the same herd? Do they need to be fed differently? Well, you can feed them differently in gestation, but rarely do we do much of any of that. And the same goes for lactation. And I think a renewed focus or renewed thought process on uh, guilt nutrition may be warranted as well. Many traits genetically correlated with sow uh, reproductive lifetime can be improved through selection. Those things like feet and leg soundness. And as I mentioned earlier, we cannot ignore the people factor on any production process, including pork production. So it goes back to my comments relative to all of the sows being called for reproductive failure, yet over 80% of those have normal pairing ovaries. So the caretaker skills and stockmanship, management ability, effects on the sow, on sow productivity should not or cannot be underestimated. And I hearken upon that just because I think this goes back to we need to put the best workers we can find in there, continually train them uh, so that they can uh, do a good job every day.
keep them motivated so that they do that good job every day uh, to achieve the outstanding performance that many of us see on common uh, on herds every day.